Welcome everybody to the Candelaria Demonstration Kitchen. I've got Chef Corey Uphold here with me today. Corey was on our podcast, I think it was episode 43 of season one, an amazing chef. We've got him on the screen right now. You'll see him drift in and out on Chopped. He was the winner of Chopped. Uh, season 42. 42, episode one, I believe. Yep. So check that out. Um, so this guy's a champion, a Chopped champion. Okay? Yeah, he won. <laughs> he won. So we got two bald guys and a beautiful girl to be our sous chef, my daughter Tiffany. And uh, we're gonna get to it. Let's have some fun today. Huh? Absolutely, absolutely. This is, this is our first cooking class of 2021. And we're looking forward to a fun year. We're gonna try to have a class every month. We've got some great chefs lined up. And um, let's get to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Tell yeah. us what you're making today. Uh, so what we're doing is we're doing a, uh, a pan sear scallop with a uh, cornbread pudding, uh, baby zucchini, a confit tomato vinaigrette in a sense and then some elements of fennel uh, going through the dish as well. Excellent. Um, and then this is actually, uh, right now I do, ever since the start of the pandemic and everything, um, I, I started a, like basically an in-home dining uh, thing called Course. But I go to people's homes, uh, uh, but I do six courses uh, for people, and this is actually course three of that. So it's okay. kind of like an in-home dining experience. It's kind of like a restaurant on wheels. It's, it's been uh, it's quite really the fun experience. It's too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's been a fun experience. and. It all kind of, I started doing it actually in 2012 because a lot of the clientele I have is, you know, a lot of wine collectors, but it, it works for them when they just pull from the cellar and I've been doing that. So but this is good. This so, is course three of the current menu right now. Okay. So what's the smallest group you will do that for? Uh, so right now it's a, I do a minimum of six. Minimum of six. And I do anything up to like the, uh, we did a 30 top uh, champagne, five course dinner. Uh, Wednesday. For thirty. So for thirty. Nice. For thirty. Yeah, we did thirty once, and it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's. I mean, you were the help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, it's fun though. It's a it's a gratifying process. Like it I, is. I love the course out meals. To me, it's it's just I don't know. They say scientifically, the human palate gets bored after the third bite. So like to me, Jeez. doing a multi course, it's it's just a better way for me to tell a story. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, what I love about you, and when I did the podcast, what was so intriguing to me was that you loved architecture. You mm -hmm. actually, your first passion was architecture. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And so when you when you plate your your creations here, they're works of art, they're Thank sculpture. You. Thank you. And so I see how you've incorporated both of those passions into your uh, repertoire here. Thank you, yeah, I'm a small, uh, you know, a, a, just a boy from a small farm town yep. when I first moved out here, and I never experienced fine dining until I moved out here. And when I did, I was intrigued. It went from architecture to you know, a different form of art. Sure. So, and you worked with chefs like Mark Tarbell and. and yep, yep. And it, it, it's been a, an amazing journey. I, I it's awesome. With a lot of great chefs. So that's it's, awesome. It's been fun. All right, well, let's watch you get to work. I'm okay. going to get on your way. Tiff's going to be your sous chef. I'm going to sit over there and enjoy a glass of wine. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to start with the, the process that's going to take the longest. And that is going to be the actual cornbread. This cornbread I've already made. It's, it's your basic recipe. There's nothing too, uh, too crazy about it, but it's. It's just cornmeal, flour, uh, egg, milk, um, baking powder, but it's very straightforward. Um, this one's just baked at 350 for about 25 minutes, allow it to rest and cool. The recipe that I put into the, the uh, online is it's actually times two, the amount you actually need, but this one, it freezes extremely well, so that's why I just do it times two. That way we have to do this process too many times. This is uh, about a, a pound of cornbread. This is what the recipe is going to call for. So this, the reason why I chose the, to focus heavily on this is because this recipe is so versatile. If this one right here, we're going to do a cornbread pudding. And it's basically exactly the way you do a normal cornbread, or I'm uh, sorry, a, a normal bread pudding, but we're going to take it one step further in which I'll show you guys. It's, we're going to actually puree the pudding before we bake it. Now, pureeing the, the pudding before we bake it is going to do, the most important thing is we're going to cut up the gluten strands. And when we do that, it's going to improve the texture of the actual uh, pudding. But also, this is so versatile is if I could add tomatillo to this and then make it a tomatillo cornbread pudding, or if I want to do chocolate, I can take out the the bread pudding and, or I'm sorry, the cornbread and put in brioche and do a nice chocolate uh, bread pudding. Yeah. So this this whole, this thing is very versatile. So Tiffany, if you want to do me a huge favor, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take this cornbread and just kind of break it up. So this is a pound of cornbread. On the other side, this is about three cups of uh, milk and then a half, I'm sorry, quarter cup of cream. This is so warm. so warm, right? Yeah. Seven eggs. 
So this is the biggest thing too, is a lot of people get scared of uh, with cooking <laughs> is people when they, when they see a recipe, they fail to realize there's a technique within all those words. And that's the biggest thing, and that, that's where I'm gonna kind of break this down. I also used to teach culinary um, at La Cordon Bleu, so like to me, the teaching's been a huge gratif you know, gratifying process. How much do I break this? That's down? perfect, that's perfect right there. So in here, we've got the eggs. So all you need for a bread pudding is bread, milk and eggs. That's all you typically need. Everything else right here is just flavoring profiles. So I can take these flavoring profiles out and interchange them. But the only thing you want to be careful is that you want to, you don't want to add any kind of liquidy bases because then we're going to throw off the whole ratio of the eggs and the milk to the ratio of the bread. We do a little bit of salt. This is a uh, roasted corn. Going to put that in there. Let's do a, two cloves of garlic. So now we're just going to puree this. It's going to pulse first. A little bit of chunky is totally fine because I'm going to re-puree this again. So right, right there is, gonna, is what you're left with. This goes on top and we're going to let this soak for probably about ideally an hour. But obviously we're going to speed up this process a little bit. So right here, let this soak. We kind of broke that up a little bit so that way it soaks a little bit faster. At home, when you're doing this, just uh, let it soak for about an hour, and then we're gonna do the next step right now. Right from here, from this step, what you're gonna do then is this would be your normal bread pudding. This is how everyone knows. This is how you do bread pudding. You pour it into the pan, you foil it, you bake it, bread pudding's done. But here's the extra step that we do, is we're gonna take this now and put it into a food processor. What this is gonna do is it's gonna improve our texture beyond Try it at home and you'll see. The texture is almost gonna be like a. Uh, it's basically like silk. It's it's crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to even explain. That's why I don't know. Just do the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just gonna put this in. And we'll post all these recipes, right, Tiff? They're already posted. They're already posted on our website. <laughs> yep, under the website. Living like, in style, and then it's a drop down recipe, and it's the the top one right now. So here we are. Inspiring living. Mm -hmm. Now we're just going to put this on. I'm just going to pulse it first. So right now what we're doing is we're just soaking. Right now it's soaking even more, but what, what we're doing is we're actually cutting up the gluten. Bread has gluten, and what right now we're, we're just shredding that gluten apart, and then and, and it, it's mm -hmm. making almost like a... The, the texture is almost gonna be like a fudge in a sense. It's different mm. texture. From right here, I'm just gonna pour this into a pan. It'd be like a, just like what you would normally do. And then of course everyone knows is a, um, a bread pudding is a custard. And it has an egg base. So what we have to do is we actually, we're gonna foil this up and we're gonna bake that in a water bath. So we're gonna fill this up with water up to the about the sat that where the level of the actual pudding is we're gonna fill it up with water as well now what this water does is when we bake in the oven water cannot exceed 180 degrees when baked into the oven so it's gonna allow this uh, bread pudding to cook gently without scrambling the eggs so that's why we do a water bath with a bread pudding this is gonna cook for about an hour and 15 minutes just kind of check it what you're gonna do is you're gonna feel the center and it's gonna be super firm uh, once it's firm, allow it to cool. And then what I did is I brought some already uh, done. So this is what it's, it's gonna feel like a oh, super firm. This one's already cooled and cut. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna portion this and this is gonna go with our scallop. Now this is the same process that like, like I said earlier, the milk, the egg, everything in the bread, that's the components to the actual bread pudding. Then the flavor agents are all separate. So you can interchange this. If you wanna do chipotle in this, it'd go like a uh, a Latin version or if you want to take away you can do a little bit of ginger garlic and cilantro and puree that in you can go more of an Asian version it, it's, it's very versatile or if you want to go dessert route you can puree in a little bit of bananas and do banana and cornbread are actually really good complements with each other a little bit of honey and you can then do a sweet cornbread banana honey pudding nice so that's why I chose to do this is that way everyone can kind of like a nice base exactly yeah 
it's a great base. It's a great uh, stepping ground That's for awesome. a, uh, a pudding. So we're going to set this to the set. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to portion this out. Once this is cool with the scallops, the scallops that we're going to be doing today, like I said, it's course three of the in-home dining that I do right now. So this one is going to be one of six courses. So this is going to be uh, basically appetizer size, a little bit smaller. Uh, so what we're going to do, if you told, if you want to do this as an entree, you can obviously cut these a little bit bigger. I'm just cutting these into nice, even sized chunks. So we will be plating uh, four of these dishes here in a little bit. Let's cut a little bit extra just to taste. So we've got your chopped episode playing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of fun. And we got yeah, Martha Studo. Uh, I got to so meet Martha asking, Stewart for the first time. I was asking about that, and, and that, was, that is pretty stressful. Even yeah. Martha Stewart as a as a judge. Oh, yeah, gosh. yeah, it and was that's stressful. pretty intense. It was so super. Just three courses, right? Mm -hmm. And they give you a basket of pre-selected items. Yep. And all all of you compete against each course. Each course, yep. yeah. It, it was a uh, it was a very stressful situation, but you know, at the end when I when I when I did win, obviously I felt way you know. <laughs> A huge relief. Uh, next up, which is going to be a tomato vinaigrette. So this is going to be a confit tomato vinaigrette. Uh, this one I already have, so I already have one already done. This is what it eventually comes Beautiful. out to. This is going to be a uh, one of the sauces that goes with this dish. Uh, but to make the confit tomatoes, this is one of these things that it's they're very simple to do. All you need is I got a little bit of thyme right here. You can take it like a nice, you know, you don't need an expensive uh, tomato uh, for this, but just kind of take off the the core itself. And then what we're going to do is, and if you were going to serve these as is like this, I recommend also that you just, you know, cut a little X on here and then put it into boiling water and then blanch and then you can take off the skin. Yeah. Uh, but on this one, it's not uh, necessary that what you can do is actually just keep the skin on. Totally fine. Mm -hmm. We're going to slice that down. And then what we'll do is just kind of, you know, cut them into eights. Okay. You're going to set your oven to about 180 degrees, which seems extremely low. But these take these are a thing of patience. Yep. You want to uh, set that to 180? Actually, we can turn that to 350 because I'm going to okay. actually heat up the, the cornbread. So this will go, what you do is you would have a tray of these. And then you would douse this with a lot of oil. Because um, actually the oil is the biggest thing that I'm also after as well. Is that olive oil or canola oil? This is, I, I do a canola oil okay. because it's more neutral. Yeah, I can tell it looks a little And I'm looking, yeah. yep. And I'm looking for that really neutral flavor. Uh, if you want to go a little bit more healthy, you go avocado oil is awesome as well. The higher heat. Yep, it's exactly. Important. Then right through here, a little bit of salt. This is this would be in the oven for at 180 degrees. This is probably going to take you at least four to six hours. Okay. So you slowly, slowly, slowly cook down. Wow. And what That's they do is it becomes almost like a raisin. So Holy cow, that's some. This is incredible. what they become from there to there. It's almost like you're making your own sun dried tomato. Almost. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's what I thought when I saw it. And when you have a tomato like this, you can, that's when you it's really know that it's actually a fruit. How many hours? When you it's taste this, it's, it's almost super sweet and acidic at the same time. Yeah. You guys ever had one of this? No. But so you like Please condensing show. it, right? Yep. Super concentrated flavor. You know what's happening? So it'll taste different because it's more juicy than it's Oh, it's crazy. It's, it's like, just the flavor condensed. It's powerful. Oh, that's really good. That's, that's the power fantastic. of patience. And patience is the biggest thing. And if you so how many hours did you say? Four to six? Four to six hours. Uh, at 150? Yeah, at, at 180. 180. If you were to go probably 160, I mean, the longer you can go, the more patience you have, the better the product's going to be. Yeah, okay. You could do 160 or 140 for 10 hours. Yeah, keep it better. Yeah, and it's not dry, it's still juicy. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, you it's beautiful. do that in your air fryer. Yep. <laughs> so these are the two products that we're left with afterwards. So this is the oil. I strain that off. You can discard the thyme. The thyme, when you're done with that, is going to be dried out. And but, uh, you can't really use it for anything after that. The tomatoes itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this over now to make our vinaigrette. Just super easy. So that oil you said is from the pan of the tomatoes? Yep, yep. So that's then good. I put a lot of oil in there because that's the biggest thing. Yeah, beautiful color. Because you want to save it. That's the biggest thing I'm actually after is that oil. Oh. And that oil is delicious too, like just uh, tossed with a salad. Um, yeah, it sounds like it would be. It's delicious. So right through here, we're going to put the, the, the tomatoes in. I'm just going to add a little bit of water to it just to get it going. Well, I'm glad we cut out the four to six hours. That was that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> good planning. Exactly. 
a little bit of uh, water. Just I just add a little bit of water just to get the blades going. Mm -hmm. You don't want to add too much or else uh, you're diluting your flavor, right? <laughs> All that work you did. So this is on. Now, like I said, this is a vinaigrette. So this is actually going to puree. Now you're going to take that oil and re-emulsify it into it. Not a whole lot, just enough that it's gonna, you're gonna see it start to thicken because we're creating an emulsion. The emulsion is a combining water and fat together to make a unified sauce. We'll turn it off. Right through here, I'm just gonna add a little bit of salt. And then red wine vinegar. It's gonna create a little bit of an acid base. Now, since this is going with scallops, I, scallops are, uh, they're almost like sea marshmallows. They're, they're, they're very kind of fatty, umptuous. So I'm going to, I'm going to put in more red wine vinegar, vinegar, because I already know my palate says it's very fatty, needs more vinegar. Now, if I was going to make this same exact sauce for a salad, I'd use less red wine vinegar because I already know salad is already bitter and not fatty. So it, every time you make a sauce, you have to think about what is it actually being served with. A tomato vinaigrette for a salad is going to be completely different than for you know, a tomato vinaigrette going with a scallop. <laughs> so those are little things you got to think about as you go. This is going to puree for a little bit. Now I also have this little thing, this is called xanthan gum. This is actually a derivative, it's a cabbage bacterium. And what it does is it, it helps emulsify my sauces better so they won't break. It also, as you see, It'll make it more unified. So this will help thick, and it also, you can see it now, it's starting to thicken. So what this does is a lot of people use this, it mimics gluten strains. Yeah. Also, so it a has- A lot of gluten-free recipes use xanthan. Yep, exactly. So yeah. this has so many things. It emulsifies, it thickens, and then it also particle suspends, so it makes it one solid, beautiful hmm. uh, sauce. So that's why I use that. You can get this anywhere, it's easy to find now. This would be our sauce base, so this is our vinaigrette. That's how it's going to usually look. Great color. It's like it's a beautiful. soup consistency. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do now is let's go on to the next step. The scallops, what we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we have our scallops. They're beautiful. These are from my friends at uh, Chula Seafood. So these scallops are just, we're going to pull them out, you know, let them come up. Uh, before you see your scallop or any kind of meat, just kind of pull them out a little early from the fridge. That way they come up to temperature a little bit and it, it just, uh, they, they're going to cook a little bit more evenly. Um, on to our next step. What we're going to do is I have some beautiful tomato, or I'm sorry, uh, baby squash. What we're going to do is we're going to put these into a pot of, this is just water. You can use vegetable stock if you had it. This can be just water. Is that This is not hot yet. We're going to put in a little salt. And I'm also going to put in a couple sprigs of thyme as well. You can use any kind of herb. You can put a little bit of garlic in there. You can put in a little bit of bay leaf. What we're going to do is I'm, now we're going to put this onto the heat. It's almost like cooking a potato. You want to cook it, you know, from not boiling water. Else you're going to cook out, cook the outside too much right away without cooking the interior. So what we're going to do is going to bring this up to temperature. So that way it cooks a little bit more evenly. Also, what I have over here, this is a sauce. This is going to be a sauce, but like I said earlier, the, uh, the dish has a lot of elements of fennel in here as well. So what I did is I broke down the fennel bulb. Usually, the fennel bulb, when you buy it, it almost looks like you know it's got all the the, the fronds on the top. Here's the base or the uh, stems, and here's the actual bulb. The bulb itself, what we do is I already took some and I shaved some. This is going to be garnish for later. A little bit of shaved uh, fennel. Uh, fennel, obviously, it tastes very, it's in the anise family, so it tastes like licorice. This is going to be a garnish later. I'll set to the side. Now, there's a, there's a sauce also in the recipe. This is the fronds. These will be used as garnish as well. This is the very tops. So now the middle base, the middle part of the actual um, fennel, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of cut this up. And it's just kind of very, nothing beautiful kind of chop it up like this and what we're going to do is we're going to put this into a pot cover cover this with water and we're going to make our basically a fennel stock 
You can put a little bit of star anise in there, a little bit of garlic also if you want to. It's going to make a, a stock just filled with water. Simmer for about 30 minutes, strain it off, and you're going to have a beautiful stock that just tastes like super licorice -y. At that the same, phenomenal. right? That sounds so good. In a separate pot, what you're going to do is we'll take a little bit of butter and cook down an onion. So on the recipe, there's a thing called a soubise, and a soubise is a basically it's a French term for an onion sauce, where the onion is cooked down and sweated down slow and low in butter until it's just like melted, and then they puree it and they turn it into a nice sauce. But this one has also got fennel in with it, so it basically it becomes a fennel soubise or fennel onion sauce. So after, at, and what I did is after cooking this down, I strained the stock into it on top of the, uh, the, the, the onion that's cooking, and then we'll puree it as well. So it's just like the process that we did there. Just puree the sauce, and then that's onion to be seasoned with a little salt and a little bit of red wine vinegar, and then, then that's your sauce base. So this we'll have over to the side. Now what we're going to do, we're going to start heating up our uh, pans here, our scallops. So these would be... Fresh. Scallops are not. Everything smells so good. To me, scallops are like, it's, they're like one of those things, like I could eat these until I'm sick. Oh, no. That's like what I order on my birthday, like special occasion, I'm like, I want scallops. They're, they're so delicious. I mean, that, that, especially when you get that really hardcore, nice sear on top, they are That's they're the amazing. key, yeah. isn't it? Yep. See, yep. I've never made them. Have you? Yeah, I mean, that's the key is to get a, get a good sear on them. Good sear. You can't overcook them because they'll Yeah, they're rubber. really yep. like rubber balls. Particular yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So, what we're going to do is heat up the pan. Now, do not season your scallops until you're about ready to sear them. What can happen is uh, if, you, if you season them too early, they're going to sweat. They're going to cure. They're going to sweat out their liquid. If, you, if they sweat out their liquid, then when we throw them into that hot pan, they're going to steam instead of caramelize. So it's kind of, uh, we have to wait until this actually, uh, the pan's about ready. We'll know when the pan is ready when we get, get it pretty hot. A little bit of oil, actually quite a bit of oil. Now we gotta wait for it to come to smoke point. Now a lot of people, that's what people do is they don't allow their pan to come to smoke point and when they put stuff in, it'll stick. And the reason why it sticks is because if you look at a pan via through a microscope, it's not flat, it has pores, almost like the moon, it has craters. So what people do is when they put in something and when the pan's not hot enough, then what happens is they drop the temperature in that area where the scalp is, and then what it does is it creates a vacuum because you cool down that temperature there and then the surrounding heat heats up, you created a vacuum. That's why food sticks. So now it makes more sense. Yeah, when totally. you think about the science oh of it, that's why food six. It's not like Alton Brown, man. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I love he has it. more hair, though. So. <laughs> not much more anymore. He's catching up to us pretty quick. So for is it. that why like, you wouldn't go straight off with butter? Yeah, I mean, any, anything that could be. I mean, if you want to sear at a high temp, uh, try to get something that's super. A, a, avocado. Oh, can yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I like wouldn't even think to use oil. I would just want butter with it. Yep. Well, you, you'll see in a little bit that I'll actually uh, t do some butter to uh, base it out as well. I see some butter. So right through here, I can see there's smoke point right there. And you can also see that the, the viscosity of your oil moves yeah. almost like water now yeah. because it's actually hot. So that's the reason why it sticks. Wow. See the smoke again? Yep. So now we know we're ready. Scalps down. Nice down. Now, as you notice, I've only seasoned with salt. A lot of people, you can do uh, white pepper with fish, or if you want, you can do black pepper. However, I don't use a whole lot of black pepper. I use it as a, um, in whole form, in a mm -hmm. sauce, and then I'll strain it out. But for the most part, um, I, uh, I don't use much pepper. You do some tongs, you got some? Thank you. See the other side. You see over here our squash coming out beautifully, still poaching away. You know, the way you can uh, see if they're it's, well, it's both. almost done is just kind of gently put your knife in there if it comes out easily. We're almost there. You can see the sides of the scallops right through here without even flipping them over, just kind of leave them. Leave them start to just caramelize. That's, that's when they're in their happy spot. Let them caramelize nicely. I can turn down the pan just a little bit. Now that I got that initial smoke point, is already up to temp. Our sauce, 
Our fennel sous vide is over here heating up nicely. Now what we're going to do also is we're going to heat up the uh, cubed bread pudding that I had earlier. Mm -hmm. Here's 350, Chef. Oh, perfect. This is going to get to go in because we're about to plate here in a little bit. All I'm doing is reheating this as it already cooks. Let's take to see our scallops right now. See the bottom, the bottom edge is getting even better. Looking how beautiful. Long, how long do you want these in here? Uh, those cubes are small enough that I'll probably leave those in there for about probably three minutes. Okay. They'll be nice and warm by then. Right, I'm watching the clock for you. Right through here now. Oh, look at the color there. There's your beautiful color. Ooh, I love that. Oh, so perfect. That's because the scallops are dry. I didn't season them too early. The pan was nice and hot. There's plenty of oil in there. Did you not season them until you put them in the so pan? So you're ready, ready to put them in. Yep. Right yep. Now here's the here's a little bit of butter. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let this come up to bernoise at, which means brown butter in French. So this is gonna caramelize. It's gonna get. It's gonna take on more of a nutty aroma, nutty flavor. Right here, fennel sauce up to a boil. Perfect. I'm gonna throw in a little bit of thyme. It's gonna pop, yep, so we're gonna always be careful when you throw that in. I think I do my steaks. <laughs> Time pops. Time pops. Brown butter, not burnt butter. Yep. Beautiful. Base the lead. Now I base everything. When I usually, all, basically all proteins I base, uh, if I'm always pan searing. Now you don't always have to use thyme. If you like just garlic, you can do garlic. Just make the butter taste better than butter. Yeah. Uh, put in some kind of aromatic. If you're doing um, uh, scallops that have an Asian, like an Asian flair to it, throw in a piece of garlic, ginger, and the stems of cilantro if you want. Whatever you want to do, just nice. make sure it tastes better. Do whatever you can to make the dish Flavorful. better. That's good. Put this off. To, take this off to the heat. It's gonna keep touching to make sure you eat it. you want them. You know, kind of cooked throughout, but you don't want them to the point where we're gonna over, you know overcook scallops are the worst. They taste like rubber. It's better to air on the underside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're just gonna allow these to sit to the side while we're gonna start plating. I'm gonna take the squash that we had earlier. Those are beautiful. These are already cooked. Now you could cut these before and then uh, cook them, but I let, the way I'm cutting these, I want these to uh, to cook more evenly, so I cook them whole first. Let's keep an eye on the scallops. Tiffany, if you actually want to do me a favor, I'm going to have you uh, cut the zucchini. The zucchini. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut about three quarters up. We're going to cut one like this, and then turn it in an angle and cut it like this. And then we're going to set them up just like this. This is our cornbread pudding. Now when you taste these flavors together, it, it, it almost reminds you kind of like in the aspect of almost like a succotash, mm. where it's like, you know, the, the flavors of corn, or, you know, and the, the squash, it, it, but it definitely reminds you almost of our, our, our approaching summer, uh, especially here. I mean, we're blessed in Arizona. We're, we're not as crazy as some of the weather and everywhere else. So now also here's a little bit, I'm gonna drizzle a little bit of uh, red wine vinegar that I have. Oh, there it is, right for me. On top. Now, if you notice the acid that I put everywhere, all of it has been consistent. I've used red wine vinegar in the vinaigrette. I've used red wine vinegar uh, just to garnish these. It's consistent. Consistent, a consistent mm. acid base throughout. A little bit of sea salt on top. And now we're about ready to start plating. That's beautiful. Here's, the, so here's where I think you are a master. I mean, like I yeah. said at the beginning of the episode today, it's just like the way you play. The, I've seen you do sketches where yes. you you kind of visualize what the end product is, and you spend time sketching it out. Yep. Like, like I love that aspect of you know uh, working it out. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing with a dish. Like it, it, it has to work. You know, I draw it sometimes just to make sure I'm on the right track. Right. So what we're gonna do now is. I also have some fennel fronds right here. We're gonna use that for garnish. Um, I also have a little bit of our shaved fennel from earlier. I'm just gonna season that again. Touch of red wine vinegar. 
We'll do a little bit of oil as well. Salt. Just a quick toss. Now this one is at uh, room temperature. You can always heat this up in the oven just a slightly if it is uh, in your refrigerator or chilled. Once again, onto our drip tray. Now we start plating. Scallop goes down. Cornbread. Cornbread's off to the right through here. Now obviously you can do any kind of plating that you want. And that's where, I mean, obviously as a chef, our, our job is obviously to make food taste good. But it's also, I believe, as culinary artists, to take it and make it look beautiful as well. Sure. It needs to be an experience. Like, food needs to be an experience. I mean, not, you know, not every day has to be an experience, but like when you go out and dine, it, ha it should be a neat experience. Absolutely. That's why you're going out. Exactly. Here's the fennel soubise. Just a little bit down. Look at that, the consistency yeah, is so beautiful. Beautiful, right? Absolutely beautiful. Fine dining. Let's do a couple of little dots. Now, this one, I like to plate kind of everywhere, not in just one spot, because that's the reason, not just plating to make things look beautiful, but it has to make sense as well. The reason why I do, this, this is acidic, so I do the acid in all different spots, so that way when people eat the dish, it's there's higher levels of acid in one spot and not the other. That way the dish is, it's every bite, is different. Hmm. So you're not missing anything either. Exactly. You're getting a little taste of all of it. Look at that, that's fantastic. Dish. That's so good. And then the way you look at it while you plate is exactly how the guest should actually see it as well. You always kind of plate, want to plate creamy things next to crunchy things. So this is creamy, then this is crunchy right through here. The scallop itself, super fatty, but then we put acidic uh, tones of acid next to it as well. So there's reasons and methods of how you actually plate stuff. It all has to make sense. It's not, not just to make it look beautiful, but it also has to make sense at the same time. Garnish yeah, these throughout as well. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, so if, if these, two, and these tomatoes can last for a long time. If you actually make those tomatoes and then put them into a container after they cool, mm -hmm. and then pour that oil on top of them, you could save those tomatoes for a good couple weeks actually wow, in the fridge. Because that fat barrier is right on top. Uh, that's why we call them confit tomatoes because confit actually means a style of preservation where you cover with fat. Uh, usually it refers to when a product gets cooked in its own fat. Tomatoes obviously don't have their own fat, so we introduce the oil itself. Okay, so I, think I think you're getting close to winning over here. <laughs> there you are. There it is. <laughs> yeah, that was such a great experience as well too. I mean, it was even better uh, when the episode was over, of course. And I, I partied pretty pretty hard that night. So tell me, you, so you, when you won, you told me you went up and, and you got to meet the judges, right? You yep. Shake their hands and, and you got to give a, uh, Martha Stewart a hug. I gave her a big hug. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> there was I, when I gave her a hug, I probably hugged her for like you know probably about like five seconds longer than you probably should. But it's like I had Martha Stewart. That's yeah, it. Then, that's it. There's one shot, right? It, exactly. So I so had a check in my pocket and Martha Stewart in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty stressful. I, I just don't know how you do that, but that's that's amazing. Well, this is great. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank this you so much. This has been fantastic, and I hope we can do it again. We really want to do this in one of our candlelit and kitchens someday. So we'll team up on one of those episodes some night. Perfect. And, uh, make a big fantastic dinner. So thank you again. We'd love to. And, and like I said, this is a this would be course three okay. of the in home dining uh, right now that I'm doing for this month. And every month I, I change the menu out. Okay. So how do we find you? Um, you can go on to uh, on Instagram, it's Chef Corey Uphold, or you can even go onto Facebook, just Corey Uphold. Uh, but I was, you know, here and there. It was first. It started out as a kind of a company that started during the pandemic. I called it Simmer Down, and I did prepackaged meal kits. So we're a little bit higher end and easy to, to cook. People could cook them in the the sous vide pouch bags, and super easy. Um, so I still do those, but then I started doing Course. This is the name of the other company that the multi course company that I'm doing. Sorry, just to drop Cool. That's awesome. So tell us about all the courses really quick. So this is course three. This would be course three. Uh, course one, uh, usually they start out a, as a it's a poached prawn, like a, almost like a prawn salad. Okay. Um, with you know flavor, Latin flavors of avocado, cucumber, uh, agua chili. Uh, second course they go into a, uh, a risotto, but it's done a little bit differently. It's got flavors of Parmesan, cured egg yolks, and asparagus. Nice. Third course is of course is right here. Yep. Uh, fourth course I do a almost like a mockery or a, a 
the thing on the shepherd's pie, where I do a lamb saucy song uh, or sausage with uh, like palms puree uh, in a salad of like peas and uh, comfy baby carrots, and then a lamb sauce made from the lamb neck, and then the uh, fourth or fifth course I do a, a steak dish from Lint's Beef, which is a small uh, farm out of Indiana. Their beef is I love their beef, especially the mm. New York and ribeyes, because it's almost sweet and acidic at the same time. Wow. Uh, just truly remarkable meat. Um, that's with a, um, almost like things that go really well with horseradish, like uh, beets, rye, yeah. uh, mushroom. Earth beef. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then uh, last is a uh, classic French dish called milfoui, but I do a little bit different, which was puff pastry and a kefir lime uh, and banana uh, pastry cream, garnished with elements of uh, um, yuzu, strawberry, and different forms of banana. That sounds fantastic. Okay, so message me who's interested in doing a dinner with Corey because we're gonna put something together in one of our Candelaria kitchens and uh, maybe we'll make it a fundraiser for one of our charities. Let's get creative. This guy's creative, we're creative. Let's do something positive out there. Thanks to everybody. Tune in next month and we will see you soon. Thank you. Enjoy, bon appetit.